I'm on this journey. I was 36 years old. I was tired, but who isn't tired? You know, you work 40, 50 hours a week. But my husband was like, do you need me to go with you? And I was like, no, they're just checking the incision. It's not a big deal. I'm going to zoom over, go in, let them check everything and come back and go to work. That did not go down like that. <laughs> so he comes in, the thoracic surgeon, with this report. And it's like, are you by yourself? And I knew right then what was about to come. Um, I just had this dark cloud of empty <laughs> that just left. You know, it was, I can't even explain it. But he showed me the scan. It looked like the most starry night you've ever seen in my lungs. And those are all little tiny uh, tumors. They concluded that this was an unfortunate case of non-small cell lung cancer. At that point, I was like, okay, I'm not going to fall apart. I'm going to bow up. I'm going to do this. I thought I was being punished for something. You know, what's wrong in my life that I'm being punished? But ultimately, I saw people that were living with this. And I'm like, oh, there's hope. I, I can... I can keep going. I'm, you know, I'm not going to be taken out of here tomorrow. You know, when I see or hear of somebody that's newly diagnosed with cancer, regardless of what kind, you know, I feel compelled to reach out to them to say, hey, you've got this. You're going to fight. It's going to get rough, but you're going to push through even when you feel like giving up, because giving up isn't an option. I am proud to tell people, I've been here for 43 months to the person that just started last month, or today, or last week, to just give hope. This is not a death sentence. We didn't know what tomorrow held before lung cancer, and we certainly don't know what tomorrow holds with it. So I try to keep that perspective as well. Hi everyone, it's Stephanie with The Patient Story and I hope everyone's doing well out there. I'm so excited to introduce our special guest for this conversation today, Ashley, who's here to share um, your story, Ashley, about uh, lung cancer, getting diagnosed with it, and living life, uh, what that means for you. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And it's good to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I know there's so much to go over, but before we go into your cancer story, I, I really love to ask people to introduce a little bit about themselves outside of the cancer context, because as we know, we are so much more than a diagnosis. So what would you like for people to know about you? Oh goodness, this is always the fun part. Um, I'm from Mississippi. I am um, an Air Force wife. Um, I am a mom to a spoiled little Dotson. So if you hear barking, it's just her. Um, I was in higher education in my career for many years. I was a registrar at my local community college and also worked in the registrar's office at the University of Alabama, I enjoyed students and um, all of that. I miss them sometimes. Um, I love musical theater. I've spent a little bit of time on the stage. Um, I've hung up my heels though, because I can't remember lines anymore. So that's that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Not too exciting. Are you kidding? That's very exciting. <laughs> like everything about you is so exciting. That's so awesome. I want to get more into the the theater, and hopefully, we get some pictures or something of you on stage. But um, <laughs> um like work that out. Yes, please. And thank you to your husband for his service and for you, you know, um, as, as the partner. Um, so appreciate that so much. Um, I also wanted to you know, really highlight sort of the beginning of your story into, into how you found out you got cancer, because um, for some people it's asymptomatic, right? It's something that isn't obvious. And for you, it was a gynecological situation. You had a Bartholin cyst and um, that's right there in the glands. And so you had to go and, and get that checked out. How did it really, well, I actually know you said that you went to the hospital eventually because 
you had to get it really checked out. Um, and it was a CT scan that was the first red flag. So Ashley, could you talk about what happened at the hospital? So um, the doctor admitted me right away um, due to the severity of the infection. And he said, but first I want you to go to the imaging center so that we can know exactly where the infection is. And it's just typical of an abdominal CT to go up to the lower portion of your lungs. And that's where nodules were notated. They thought, well, it's not uncommon to have nodules show up in the lungs when there's infection in the body. And so he was like, we're not gonna worry about that but we are going to be solution-minded and figure out exactly why. So two weeks later, you know, we looked again and they were still there when I went back for follow-up. But nothing in the hospital was mentioned about um, the lung situation at that time. We only dealt with the, the issue um, that I was dealing with right then and there. And, but he didn't, you know, he didn't forget it. He was solution-minded. He could have said, oh, it's from the infection. We're not gonna worry about it and sent me away. And then I'm a ticking time bomb. Um, but he was very solution-minded and kept a watch on it. Um, and then forwarded me, I always say punted, punted me to a pulmonary specialist to mm -hmm. you know, look into this. And it was very rare. And so he felt like it, it needed attention. It's so nice to hear, Ashley, that you had someone who um, was, you know, mindful and really paying attention and not just saying like, ah, you know, you go home and you take care of this, but kind of really led you to the next person. Yes. And so this pulmonary specialist you see, uh, you know, gives you a bronchoscopy. So they're checking your lungs, your air passages. Can you um, describe that procedure just a little bit and what else was done at that point? He initially did a breathing test, which it was like, if you know anything about how it's rated, it was like a 94%. I was breathing fine. If you've never had one, it's so hard to do all of that in and out. And, uh, but anyway, I made it. Um, the bronchoscope, I was um, pretty much under anesthesia kind of in a twilight zone kind of thing. Um, you know, they did uh, put me to, to sleep, but it wasn't like full blown. I didn't know what was going on, but I woke up pretty quick too. And, um, you know, they went in, got some cells, evaluated those, and it was non-diagnostic. They couldn't, um, he did his own scans, of course, but, um, it didn't tell them anything. It was non-conclusive. And so then we went to a needle biopsy. And um, he, you know, obviously went in through my back to the biggest nodule that I had. I had over a hundred spread across both lungs, little bitty tiny, one millimeter or less. And um, there was one that was like three. And so he went in to grab some tissue from that um, nodule that was a little larger than the rest. And that too was non-conclusive, non-diagnostic. And by this time I'm like, what is wrong with me? Um, it, he thought he asked questions like, did you, do you work in the soil? You know, do you garden? Do you plant flowers? Do you work in a, um, a plant of any kind? And of course those answers were no. And um, he showed me the scan. It looked like the most starry night you've ever seen in my lungs. And those are all little tiny uh, tumors, but he didn't, you know, he said, normally we would watch this for four months, come back, see if anything has grown. If everything's the same, then these are benign and we're just gonna watch them. But he said, this is very rare. I was 36 at the time, I'm 40 today. And he said, this is way rare for somebody that doesn't work in the soil, doesn't work in any sort of plant, doesn't work around chemicals, um, never smoked. So he too was very solution minded um, in trying to figure out what in the world, you know, I thought, okay, well, 
I have um, some sort of fungus in my lungs because we he mentioned that and that, you know, who knows why you get that. I thought, okay, I'm going to get an inhaler and we're going to blow this junk out and I'm going to roll out. I wasn't coughing. I wasn't, you know, I was tired, but who isn't tired? You know, you work 40, 50 hours a week. You know, I wasn't losing weight. I wasn't, you know, nothing had changed. And so it was all of those, you know, this, is, this didn't tell us anything. And then that didn't tell us anything. And so I was like, oh. So even though sometimes you don't want to know, you, at this point, I wanted to know. And that's when I was sent to a thoracic surgeon. So my patience was on edge, of course. I'm like, I need to know what this is. And I need to know now. And sometimes it's, it's that, <laughs> waiting, I mean, really the waiting period is the worst part, right? When you don't have anything to go on, you're just can I get something so I can have a plan here? I just want to understand what's going on. And let me understand this um, clearly. So you weren't feeling any symptoms. I mean, you weren't like coughing or feeling anything, a shortness of breath or anything like that. No, none of that. Okay. And you know, the occasional allergies. I'm in Mississippi. I mean, we have all sorts of stuff. And so I have horrible allergies. I get a sinus infection, you know, every year, but the, you know, nothing out of the, um, nothing abnormal at all. Okay. And so you are sent to the thoracic surgeon. Um, tell us about, you know, what he or she said to you in terms of what they wanted to do. And if you could describe that, that process. Well, he wasn't there to be my friend at all. He was all about business and cut and dry. So that made me a little uncomfortable. Um, but he was so knowledgeable and he was very, the very best, I feel like, that I could have gotten in the whole entire state. So he comes in, he plops down and he's like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to collapse your lungs. We're going to put a tube down. We're going to go in and take out two or three sections of your lungs and we're going to send it off to Mayo or we're going to evaluate it. They didn't know what it was. So it ended up going to Mayo. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, <clears throat> and so I was just staring at him like, hold on back <laughs> you're gonna do what and um I was like do we really have to do this and he said no it's up to you we don't have to do anything but if you want answers this is what we need to do <laughs> he was one of those guys <laughs> and I was like yes sir so we did it he's like let's do this next week whatever so um into the operating room I went and um, it was, um, that was the first time I had ever had anything major done surgery-wise. That was the first time I had experienced, um, you know, real anesthesia, not just the twilight stuff. And um, so I had a lot to, to take in, you know, the papers that if they, you know, put the tube in and it did something else to something else in my body, I could, you know, they weren't responsible. It was possible that, you know, there could be an issue with my lung and they would have to go back in if certain, you know, if air got in there. And so it was all the bad things they told me that could happen. And I'm like, okay, I can do this. They're the experts, not me. I won't know it, whatever it is. <laughs> and so waking up I was in a lot of pain I felt like you know there were knives stabbing me in the chest but um a few hours with morph a morphine pump and I was okay he removed the line removed the tube and um I was I was okay the, the tissue he called in his other um cohorts if you will to look and he told me he would be able to tell me what was going on by the time I left the hospital that next day, but he did not know. He said he'd never seen anything like it. It was like ground glass um, looking nodules, he said. And um, so that's when the path went to Mayo Clinic in Arizona.
and they made that the final conclusion. But even then, I still didn't have answers. And um, it wasn't until about a week later when that pathology was returned to him from the Mayo Clinic that they, um, and I'm looking at it here, that they concluded that this was an unfortunate case of non-small cell lung cancer. That's a lot. I mean, <laughs> just like you're waiting, waiting, and then boom, right? It's like it just then just happens so quickly. Um, the so the lung tissue removal uh, when you woke up. Do you remember how long that took? It was just they gave me a little bit more anesthesia than normal. I don't know if I was being difficult or what, but um, I it took me a little longer to wake up than most, and so I think the whole process was maybe around an hour if, okay. um, and that's from prep to, um, you know, in uh, recovery and whatnot. But I don't, I don't recall exactly, but it wasn't very long at all. Like you would think that seems like a daunting <laughs> process, yeah. but you know, he, they're the expert and that was their first time. And so. And uh, how long did it take for, uh, Mayo Clinic for everything to get back up with the results again? It was about seven days. So a week. Okay. And they, they tricked me at the doctor's office because he said the nurse called and said he was going on vacation and he wanted to check those incisions on the side. Um, and so I was like, oh, okay. So, I, you know, told my job. And I was just going to run over there. My incision was fine. I knew it was fine, but okay. And then come back. And here he comes in with that pathology report. I was by myself. Oh. But my husband was like, do you need me to go with you? And I was like, no, they're just checking the incision. It's not a big deal. I'm going to zoom over, go in, let them check everything and come back and go to work. That did not go down like that. <laughs> So he comes in, the thoracic surgeon, with this report and is like looking behind the door, you know, looking around this little tiny room and it's like, are you by yourself? And I knew right then what was about to come. I knew, um, I just had this dark cloud of empty <laughs> that just left, you know, it was, I can't even explain it, but um, I was like, yep, I'm by myself. And um, at that point, I was like, okay, I'm not going to fall apart. I'm going to bow up. I'm going to do this. And I say often that, that was the, for lack of better words, the gut punch, the sucker punch of my life. And many I know also can relate and would say the same, but came out of left field for sure. Um, especially when you're thinking, oh, it's just benign. Nobody has lung cancer in my family. I don't smoke. This ain't lung cancer. But it was. I mean, gosh, like gut punch really sums it up. I can feel it because <laughs> you, know, you, you know, and yes, a lot of people, we grew up with the ads about, you know, don't smoke in the, the lung cancer thing. Oh, yeah. so, you know, if I don't smoke. So there's that. I know the campaign for a lot of people right now, it's been going on is if you have lungs, you can get lung cancer, but it's not something that we grew up with maybe. Um, right. And you're by yourself. And so can you recall that moment? I know you, we're trying to keep it together, but I mean, what was going through your mind? Like, do you, how, how, I mean, I'm sure you remember that moment so clearly. It was almost like an out of body experience, a dream I was going to wake up from. Um, and he was very uh, not compassionate. <laughs> he was like, I'm sorry, darling, this is lung cancer here. You want this report? she'll help you with the rest. Good luck. Pat, pat on the shoulder. Out he went. Unbothered, you know, which I know it's not his job to feel sorry for me or to coddle me or whatever, but it could have been a little bit more. I mean, this is life changing here, but anyway, he, he did a good job. Bedside manners, 
were not his thing. But the nurse was very kind to me and said, I'm going to be praying for you, you know, um, which I welcomed. But I kept it together until I was in the room alone when she went to make the phone calls. And I opened up my phone and texted my friend that was a um, hospitalist for that hospital and was like, I have to see an oncologist. Who do I see? And, you know, I was fight. I could hardly see the, the, the letters and numbers on the phone because I was like fighting tears. And um, the lady came back in and I told her who I wanted to see um, as far as the oncologist goes based on the recommendation from my friend. Thankfully, I had somebody on that side of things um, that was in the know because I, I didn't know any of them. And um, I remember walking out of that doctor's office and the ladies at the front desk were like, hey, how are you? They had no clue what I had just heard. They were just doing their job and being nice. But I remember just not looking up at them, not just, I looked down and was like, fine, handed them my paper, gave them my debit card to pay my copay or whatever it is I had to pay. And I just like kept my head down walking out that door. I can tell you exactly what those carpet tiles looked like even today. <laughs> and so I uh, was dressed for work. So I was, I had on dress pants and heels and um, I, often say, and this is the best way I know how to put it, I felt like I had cinder blocks for shoes on my feet, just putting one step in front of the other just to get the heck out of there, just get me out of here. And when I heard the click of my car door, I lost it. I lost my mind. I was weeping and wailing. If somebody was nearby, they likely would have called um, a crisis intervention officer to come help me because I lost it. And I cranked up my car and just sat there. And then I had to call my husband and say, this is what's happening. And then I called my mother. She's like, do you need me to come and get you? I was like, no, I can drive. I don't remember the drive to her home, but um, I, um, and then I called uh, my dad. And so those are the three that I called. Um, and then the next day was a PET scan to just make sure there wasn't cancer anywhere else in my body. So it was a big two days. I was on the phone the rest of the day telling people and people were calling me and people were sending messages because word traveled like wildfire. And I was just mentally exhausted um, from the whole thing and to have to um, you know think about that and relive that in my mind it's like <sighs> because it was you know people say well it's not a death sentence da 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 well of course I went straight to google and it was like oh you're you're out of here, 2%, or it was in the teens at the time, you know, survived beyond five years. So I'm like, I'm out. This is the end. And so that was heavy, you know, thinking about my own mortality. I still am forced to think about it, but I'm almost four years in. And so I have gained a lot of strength in that amount of time, for sure. Oh my gosh. Thank you for sharing that, Ashley. I mean, what a whirlwind. I mean, that's an understatement, but <laughs> to, you know, to know that you you hadn't even thought of this and then boom, you're hit with this, you're by yourself and and having to break the news to your, your family um, and then dealing with the, you know, the messages I'm sure you got after. Um, I, I want to definitely um, talk about that too later on in this conversation, just the support that helped the most uh, like throughout this entire, um, you know, situation. Um, 
I do want to, you know, shift over now to um, the next section, the next segment, which will be treatment decisions. And that will include, you know, your decision on where to go, as well as the genomic testing involved and the treatment. So stick around.